This is Michael King, and this first of two videos on financial statement analysis. We're going to look at financial ratios. This is sections 4.1 through 4.6 in Booth, Clear, and Rikita. And our goal today is really to understand how to use financial ratios to assess a company's financial performance. This is a method that's used by equity analysts, shareholders, as well as creditors to evaluate a company. And typically it's by looking at a company relative to its closest peers, which may be called comparable companies or compcos. The inputs that we're going to be using are coming from accounting as well as from markets. So we're going to be using data that's provided in financial statements under either IFRS or US GAAP, reflecting uh, choices that the companies make, which we're going to have to understand. We're also going to look at market variables such as share price and market capitalization. And these variables are going to fluctuate uh, with market movements, so we have to be careful in how to interpret them, and typically we do that by looking at one company relative to another. If you take the CFA designation, this is basically standard material that will be covered on how to use financial ratios to make an investment decision. So how do we use financial ratio? Basically, financial ratios are just one number divided by another, so they don't have any particular meaning if we don't look at them in some sort of context. There's going to be three particular context that we need to look at. First one is going to be looking at the trend for a given company over time. How is this ratio changing from last year to this year and versus the average for maybe the past three to five years. We're also going to look at similar companies at a given point in time or cross-sectionally. How does this company's ratio compare to its closest peers? And we're also going to want to look at a company's ratios relative to their stated strategy. The way that analysts will use this information is to look for what we call outliers or red flags. And this is all part of what I call crime scene investigation, finance. And you're going to use these tools to become a forensic financial analyst. Once you get familiar with these financial ratios, you'll be able to use them to analyze the company's financial statements very quickly and to spot things that require more investigation. So when we look at the financial ratios, we're going to be using the inputs, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement and you need to have a very good understanding of these three different statements in order to use them effectively. So don't forget that uh, the balance sheet just shows the assets and how they're financed using debt and equity. The income statement is for a given year showing how much sales and how much of it falls to the bottom line. And finally the cash flow statement is going to show you how the company uses or generates cash through its operations, its investing and financing activities. So financial ratios, how do analysts use them? Well, they, they tend to have a preferred set of ratios that they will use, which are very, very common, but may be defined differently depending on who's using them. So be very careful when looking at financial ratios because some people will define them differently. Uh, we're going to look at sales growth and margins, profitability, which can be broken down into its components using the DuPont decomposition, we're going to look at productivity, which is how efficiently a company is going to use its working capital and assets. The liquidity of a company, its leverage. And finally, we're going to look at valuation multiples of earnings, book value, and EBITDA. So let's take a look at Apple Inc., how it's done from 2015 to 2019. Here we can see its sales growth from year to year. Below that, we see the gross operating and net margins for the company. And finally, we look at how important COGS are, or cost of goods sold, R&D, and sales general and administrative as a percentage of sales for each year. Notice that we're looking at multiple years, and we're also calculating the average. When it comes to sales growth, we're looking at the compound annual growth rate. When it comes to the others, we're looking at the simple or arithmetic average across these five years. And that's how we're going to do this trend analysis for Apple. So what do you notice about sales growth? Well, contrary to what you might think, sales growth has been up and down for Apple. Very positive year in 2015, also in 2018, but a very weak year in 2016, and also a decline in 2019. You want to understand is what's driving these increases in growth as well as pullbacks. Likely it's due to launch of new products and whether they're successful or not. When looking at the different margins, you see that gross profit is, is when you deduct cost of goods sold from sales. Operating margin is when you go lower down on the income statement to earnings before interest and taxes as a percentage of sales. And then net margin is looking at net income over sales. On all three dimensions, 
Apple is extremely profitable and has been very consistent over time. The one thing we do see is that we do see a, a marginal decline from 2015 to 2019, but still very good, very high numbers across all three margins. What's really causing the decline in margins? Well, if we look at the percentage of sales, COGS has gone up from 60% to 62%. We see that R&D has increased, which could be viewed as very positive, from 3.5% to 6.2% in 2019. And sales general and administrative expenses has, has risen from 6.1% to 7%. So those would be things that equity analysts would want to track over time. If we look at profitability, there's going to be two metrics that we're going to use. One of them is return on equity, which is used by shareholders to judge how much net income is that they receive. Return on equity could be using the end of year shareholders equity in the bottom of the ratio or the average taking the start and the end values. As you can see here that Apple had ROE that was extremely high, 44.7%. It actually declined for two years in 2016-17 before rising in 2018 and 2019. Notice how dramatically high the ROE is for Apple. Most typical U.S. companies might be at 15, uh, 10 to 15% and be very satisfied with that. ROE for Apple is a staggering 50 to 60%. Notice that it's gone up in recent years, even though we saw sales have, have been weak. The second measure is ROA, return on assets. It simply relates net income to all the assets, which means it's important for both creditors and shareholders. Notice that ROA is kind of giving you a more base profitability, and this base profitability actually was gone from 18.4% down to a low of 12.9, and then has recovered, but is not as high as the ROE. The reason, of course, is that Apple has been using leverage and has been financing more of its assets with debt, which has allowed it to have a higher ROE. The other thing to keep in mind is both of these ratios are going, to met, are going to relate an income statement or flow variable to a balance sheet or stock variable. ROE can be broken down into three parts. Here we see the ratio. ROE is net income over shareholders' equity. It can be broken down into these three different ratios. The first one is called the net profit margin. And as we saw, it's simply net income over sales. And that's the ability to generate profits from each dollar of sales. The second ratio is actually asset turnover, which means how much sales are you generating for every dollar in assets. And the third is financial leverage, looking at how much of the assets are financed using equity. Increases in any of these three will increase the ROE of the company. Likewise, a decline in each of them would cause the ROE to go down. Notice that this first two here, net income over sales times sales over assets, is actually the return on assets. If you just took out the sales from both, you would see that it is net income over assets. Notice also that if you take the three ratios and multiply them by each other, not only do the sales cancel out, but so do the assets, leaving us with net income over equity. So if you can't remember this ratio, just remember net income's at the start, equity's at the end, at the bottom, and we have three ratios, you'll be able to figure it out. How is Apple doing? Here we see are we which has increased from 35, 36% in 2016-17 to 56 to 61%. So what was driving it? Well, if you look closely, you can see that net profit margin has actually been steady or declined from 22.8 to 21.2%. So that's clearly not the reason. What's going on with asset turnover? Well, asset turnover has not really increased either. It's actually it dropped marginally to 2017 and then recovered, but it does not explain the large increase. So what is going on is leverage. We see that financial leverage has gone from 2.4 times to 3.7 times, a steady increase, and that is directly leading to the increase in ROE. Notice that even though ROE is going up, return on assets, which does not take into account leverage, has declined to from 18% to 16%. Let's look at productivity, where productivity is how well you use working capital as well as fixed assets. There are two different ways that you can look at productivity. One is just to look at the turnover measures, 
This is how much sales you're generating or how much cost of goods sold you're generating per dollar of these items. Or you can convert these ratios, these turnover ratios, into days of different metrics. So we have days of receivables, days of inventory, days of payables. You can see that Apple takes 29.1 days on average to collect its, its account receivable. They take 8.5 days on average to clear out their inventory. So eight and a half days of sales are on the shelves in their stores. Finally, you can see that they take 107.9 days to pay their suppliers. So you can see that they're actually being very slow to pay their suppliers and this is benefiting Apple shareholders and hurting their suppliers. We're going to come back to this topic later when looking at working capital management. So there are three different formula that you can use here and I'm showing the calculations for each of them. There's a couple of key things to note. Notice that when we're looking at days of accounts receivable, we're looking at it relative to the average sales on a given day, which is sales over 365. That's because accounts receivable is what the customer pays, and so the customer pays the final sale price. When it comes to days of inventory and days of accounts payable, however, we're looking at these relative to the average cost of goods sold per day. COGS at, its, at the price of its inventory, what you've paid the suppliers, and likewise, what you pay the suppliers is also related to uh, the cost of goods sold. Liquidity looks at the ability of a company to convert working capital into cash to pay its current liabilities. And you can see that a higher ratio is going to be better, meaning more ability to pay. If you look at simply current assets over total assets, you can see that current assets over total assets is around uh, 0.3 to 0.4 or 30% to 40% of assets. Current ratio is actually measuring the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. And you can see that the current assets are greater than current liabilities, which is positive. If you were to only look at cash, short-term marketable securities, and accounts receivable, which are the most liquid ones, as a ratio of current liabilities, you have what's called the quick ratio. So how is Apple doing? Well, Apple seems to be improving in liquidity. You can see the trend over time looking at the numbers from 2015 to 2019, has been improving, and you can see that the final years, 2019, are higher than the average. Let's look at leverage, which is the use of debt to finance assets. We're going to look at leverage as a measure of risk, or the risk of default in particular, although it can be used to increase return on equity, as we saw. So there's going to be one way to judge it, is looking at the ability of the company to pay interest expense and avoid uh, missing on those payments. The ratio that we're going to use is called the EBIT interest coverage, which the textbook calls times interest earned. It's going to be earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. And you can see here that it's a very high number. It starts at 97, goes down to 17.9. That's obviously because Apple has been increasing its debt. We can see the quantity of debt increasing by looking at total debt, either as a ratio of shareholders' equity book capitalization, which is debt plus equity, or total assets, which would be total liabilities plus total equity. No matter how you look at it, you can see that it's going up. And you can see that debt has increased as a percentage of total assets from 58.9% to 73.3%, which is consistent with what we've seen, increasing leverage. Mm -hmm.